as this is all happening in the background, Andy, anything you want to tell us this week? I'm, I'm, I'm sure Andy will tell us about some kind of a conference. No. No, there's um, one thing that was interesting. I was watching a, a program on the telly about archaeology, and it was you know going. We were talk. We've been talking about how how difficult it is to classify periods, and oh, by I love it. And, and it and it was uh, it was over in uh, northeast Russia, and they were talking about a site that was they, they thought was four to six hundred A.D. and they called it Iron Age. And I thought that's not Iron Age. And I thought, well, I suppose it might be over there, but. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. It's oh, uh, it 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 re it reminds me of the Papua New Guinea thing, doesn't it? That that yeah. in the pa Papua New Guinea, they're still in the Stone Age. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Or in in, in our side, they're still um they're still in Industrial Revolution. <laughs> On a good day, yeah. Without the indus industrial bit. Yeah. The <laughs> same Britain put, should pay recompense to such as India because of the damage that we caused yeah. with our industry. Yeah. Yeah, it's all, all the fault of Manchester, apparently. <laughs> oh, well, well, it don't affect us over here, and it don't affect but people in the kin in the can, country of Cornwall, is it? We can narrow it down to Shropshire and blame it on Ironbridge. Ah. <laughs> oh, shut up. Cornwall's gone into the space age now, isn't it? Yeah. I wish it bloody would. I wish I wish somebody had raised it from the map, Pete. Oh, but, lovely not place. Very nice. I know you don't like the Celts, but there we are. They were superior to <laughs> you. <laughs> but, uh, the problem is, Pete, right? What should go from the map is the Camelot Hotel. Right, yeah. It, it, it particularly, because what it is, Pete, Pete left his sort of flag on the mast with that one. Right, who, are, who have we done this so far? Andy, we've done him. We've done yeah. David. Right, Pete, any news from you, darling? No, sorry, I haven't been out. Right, who, who's next? Margaret? No, nothing. Oh, right, OK, all the pressure is now on Drina. Drina, <laughs> you've got five <laughs> seconds to come up with some kind of made-up story and you've got to give us some news. I, I, I haven't verified it, but somebody said they oh. thought they found the tomb of an Egyptian queen, maybe Cleopatra. Is that true? Ooh. I don't know. I haven't checked it. I, not, not, I, not. I seem to remember there was something said about that. Yeah. I don't think it was Cleopatra, but it was an Egyptian queen. Mm. Yeah. Nefertiti, maybe? don't know. Mm. Oh, yeah. OK, fair enough. Did they think that she was um, Tutankhamun's mother, Nefertiti? Uh, no, yeah, yeah, Nefertiti, yeah. So that was Hatshepsut. Oh, I don't no, know. No, <laughs> no. That's Akhenaten. Oh, yeah. Nefertiti, Nefertiti was the wife of Akhenaten. Yeah. They reckon oh, that God. Nefertiti's where Tutankhamun was buried. It's actually Nefertiti's various places one, one one back yeah right and he died very suddenly so they just shoved him in, in front of <laughs> the next chamber in front of her just shoved him in <laughs> yeah. yeah well he did take a lot of stuff with him he did he was a bit of a hoarder <laughs> mm. right okay so well, i'd love to say something because i Hang on a minute, hang on a minute, hang on. There was a voice from the dark then. Did you, did you open your lips, Pete? I, that was me. Uh, I, I, am, no, I am so sorry. I, I upset David last week. Now I've upset you. I, I, I'm, doing, I'm doing really well, isn't I? Right, OK, Margaret, OK. We haven't forgotten you. Tell us. Anne. No, it's Anne. Yeah. Who am I talking to? Anne. Anne. What, who did I say? Margaret. Said Margaret. <laughs> oh my God! Right, okay, right. Just, just, and just talk. Just, just, you know, everyone's going to be leaving in a minute, right? They've had enough, right? <laughs> just, just, just tell us. Well, I've been doing a lot of uh, study recently about nutrition and illness, and last night I was looking at. Oh, wow arthritis and I thought that's something that would probably be found in archaeology because it's to do with bones and things and I found um, 
Harvard University had done a, a, some lo looking into this and they found uh, a creature that was 200 million years old. Ooh. It was part of our genetic background. Well, well, hang, on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let's just start again. Two, did you say 200 million years old? Yes. That's what they said. I mean, I'm... Well, that's a what, I'm what's precisely it on wasn't the wasn't human, it was, it was a pre-human, it was something before mm. us. And, right, and that okay. had a lot of arthritis. They also found that they found a Neanderthal with arthritis. They found uh, a <laughs> lot of it in um, <coughs> Egypt and Nefertiti. Uh, it, it yes, 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 you're right, Nefertiti. I can confirm that. And, yeah. and, and also... <laughs> The Romans had it, and they had sort of treatments where they used oils and things to try and resolve it. It is since the Second World War, it has more than doubled, and they they think they th thought for first thought it was all wear and tear on the knees, but because okay. adjusting for age and weight, it's done this doubling, and they feel it may be lack of exercise. And certainly there's a there's a nutritional element in it. I just found the whole thing interesting. It was about well, art, but it was about I found things out about the past in looking at what I was interested in, in today, what I'm looking at today. Oh, that's fantastic. You tend okay, to think that exercise causes arthritis, especially well, in your knees. Well, that's right, but they but they did now don't think this. And as I say, the evidence isn't isn't looking at it. They're saying <laughs> Because you'd think, you'd think with all the exercise they did in, say, hunter-gatherer times, far more than we do, they'd have had a lot more trouble than us. And yeah. they didn't. We, and ours has doubled if you take into account weight and um, uh, what sort of thing? weight and exercise. They found um, we are more than twice as bad since the Second World War and they the one of the things they were considering that it's lack of exercise that is causing it rather than too much, which I just thought was interesting, mm. which came from this looking at the old bones. Mm. No, that, I that, that, agree that, with that. that what's that? Uh, uh, I had arthritis in my knees after 40 years of stairs and ladders in the chemical industry. And I'm sorry, you had plenty it. of exercise in that. Yes, but they didn't say it was only exercise because food is also playing a part. Yeah, fair enough. And that, damp weather. The, the, the diet that we've been eating, the, the Western diet which we've had, yeah. is uh, yeah. not a problem for a long time. Uh, on behalf of Margaret, right, is there more arthritis in the Northern Hemisphere, which is damp, um, as opposed to people in the Southern Hemisphere, which is not I think damp? So. Yeah. My daughter suffered, she has rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, so um, and it flares up badly when she comes back here. Yeah, I think it the damp flares makes it up worse. badly yeah. in in the warmer weather. She's mm. not too bad at all. Rheumatoid arthritis is different. I was looking at osteoarthritis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it is a different uh, disease. Yeah. yeah, she's got another. She's got another form of arthritis as well. I was talking to a, a guitarist on Friday night. Um, it's kind of my kind of age and he'd been diagnosed with arthritis in his fingers a few yeah. years ago and told that there's not a lot he could do about it and did a bit of research tried a diet and got rid of it yeah and he said it's better diet now is and stronger diseases, yeah. 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 That's, what, that's where my interest has been in the last two yeah. years i've been really really I'm quite astonished by it yeah um, oh, they say cider vinegar is a good thing on that note, guys, well, we're apple cider it. vinegar apparently is supposed to be very good for the joints and things. Yeah. yeah. And you can get that in tablet form. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Very true. On that note, we've got to crack on. So, uh, okay, okay. Now, I, I, I want us to um, get to grips with, the, with our wonderful Neolithic period, as we were doing last week, and starting into it. And uh, I was going, I wanted to um, look at introducing, uh, introducing another type of site, which is one that you may not have come across, something called a bank barrow. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, I just wanted to think of something else today as well. So I'm, I might do that first, which is looking at 
how we should examine um, a landscape in the Neolithic period and, and how complicated landscapes are in the Neolithic. So what we mean by that is if we can go directly to um, screen share, and this is where we're gonna go now. Um, and if we go here and we go there, that's a bank barrel by the way, bingo. Now, th this might be familiar, Avebury, uh, Silbury Hill, West Kennet, Long Barrow, uh, West Kennet Avenue. Well, the sanctuary, we're not going to be doing this today in, in, in any detail, right? In fact, it's just as a backdrop. The one thing I would say is that it, it, when, when, we, when we look at the Neolithic period, it's almost as if the Neolithic period is divided into zones. And, and what we need to do with that is try to understand what I mean by zones. And uh, Andy may have come across this years ago with me, and it was something that I was looking at, um, trying to divide this Neolithic landscape into sort of bite size, sort of in a bite size approach. So I would I would use one category as a forbidden. Um, the forbidden area, and I'll explain what that is now. Uh, another area which is living and farming, another area that is burial, and another area that is land for the ancestors, right? So what you can clearly see in front of us on this little sort of overview of, of the World Heritage Site Boundary, the UNESCO World Heritage Site Boundary of Avebury and Wiltshire, is that you've got Silbury Hill, is Silbury Hill a, a part of the living farming landscape? Is it part of the burial landscape? Is it part of the land of the ancestors, right? Probably not the, not the other two. It's probably part of what we, would, what we would refer to as the land of the ancestors. So as Andy knows, doing Silbury Hill in, an, in two hours is not possible. So we won't be doing that today. But again, we're, we're sort of giving, we're still in the early stages of looking at the Neolithic period. Um, these avenues, they might represent what's, what I would refer to uh, as land of the ancestors and the burial landscape, uh, West Kennet Long Barrow and, and some of the other barrows marked on this, this sort of little landscape in front of us. But there's one catch with all of that. The, the landscape associated with the Neolithic developed and become very complicated over a long period of time. So you're talking about the Neolithic period is, is, a, is a massive chunk of our history. Um, it ranges from approximately 8,000 years ago all the way through to about 4,500 years ago. So you, you've got a big chunk of time there, three and a half thousand years, where, where everything's going on. And uh, this word burial landscape, this, this word land of the ancestors, living, farming and forbidden. And one, one thing that we're talking about, even on this sort of little chart in front of us, it's not showing anything in regards to where people were living, farming. Um, it's not showing where this forbidden landscape is. So to try and get that across to you, I need to get my little scribbly chart in here. I need to get my little sort of uh, my little chart in here. So that's where we're going to go now. And what we need to do, we need to go back to there and we need to stop that. And we need to get, we need to do my little uh, whiteboard. So it's probably at this stage, probably best to try and get a little bit of a pen out um, on a little bit of a pencil. So one, um, forbidden landscape. What, what do I mean by a forbidden landscape? Well, a forbidden, a forbidden landscape is all those areas that you don't go into. All those areas in the archaeology that we don't really know anything about what was going on in the Neolithic period, such as those woodlands, and such as those forests. But they're not just forests and woodlands, they're primeval forests. Primeval because they are primeval. They've not been touched by human beings. So if you can imagine a forbidden landscape, it's a forbidden landscape that would have massively chunky trees. There would be bears roaming around there. 
There'd be odd wolf. There'd be weird creatures like pine martens and otters and pigs and all these other things. Um, and a pig would tear a human being apart in a primeval woodland and forest. It's their domain. Now, the one thing that we, we need to chuck in here, and uh, one thing that I'm really struggling with every single day, when, when I go out in a car and I'm driving around and doing whatever I'm doing, right, is I'm, I'm driving down the road and thinking, is there anything within this landscape that is remotely primeval? And the answer is no. Is there any woodland or forests? Well, there might be the odd sort of alcove of, of primeval woodland and forest, but the forbidden landscape to our Neolithic ancestors has all but gone. There's very little to none of it left. Um, and it, it's, it's, again, part of the world of the map of Britain in the Neolithic from 10,000 years ago that was very, relatively untouched and changed for a good 3,000 years. 3,500 years until things started to change again in the Bronze Age, the Copper Age, and then the Bronze Age, because we will be doing a Copper Age after the Neolithic period. We're not just going straight into the Bronze Age, we're going to do the Copper Age, which will really make things complicated for me, but will it? Because I've got copper mines on Great Orm. Uh, we forget about the silly little tin miners in Cornwall for a while. Um, and then, sorry, Pete. Um, and then we think about sort of all types of burials in the Copper Age. But we're not even there yet. We're still doing the Neolithic period. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to sort of get rid of that. Here we go. Uh, I'd like to talk about category number two. Now, one thing, one thing, that, we, one thing that we do lack, of, lack in British archaeology uh, is much in regards to a living and farming landscape. Am I right and wrong in that statement? Well, in actuality, yes, I'm com completely wrong. Uh, because much of the living and farming landscape has really not been interpreted and studied as much as the other landscape that we we're going to be talking about, the third landscape, such as the burial landscape, um, or or as some of us would like to call it, the ritualistic landscape, or even better, a word that you'd be more familiar with you, talking about the megalithic landscape, right? With all these chambers and with these standing stones and with all these other things, wood hinges, yeah, we'll put that in there as well. So the living and farming landscape is, what, if you really, really want to understand how people lived in the Neolithic period, you need to go to Orkney. Because we're at, uh, we're in Orkney, near the Ness of Brodgar, we've got something called Barn House. We, we've got the Ness, uh, where they're excavating uh, uh, at Brodgar itself. We've got a wonderful things, lots of wonderful, lots of wonderful things. If, for example, um, it, on the island of Orkney, right? But, and then what we're starting to do is we're starting to find Neolithic evidence elsewhere, but it, it's, it's, it's very slowly coming towards us. Uh, and the farming landscape, we can think about, there are what's called um, lynchets, uh, uh, which, which are um, sort of indications where, where there's been some kind of Neolithic sort of, um, sort of farming uh, within the Neolithic period, uh, which, which, which are soil creeps and so on, which might have occurred due to farming in the Neolithic period. So, so we get things like that out there. So there's a farming landscape, but we're only starting to come to it today. Next, the next thing we want to do is we want to look at number three, burial or, or whatever, megalithic. What we're going to do, oh, hang on a minute. My my writing's terrible. Uh, what we're going to do? We're going to we're going to write the word megalithic, megalithic landscape, because the word megalithic um, appeases the word burial. And when I say appeases the word burial, when you're thinking of sites about sites site such as Avery and Stonehenge um, and um, Places like Stanton Drew, um, and you, you look at the Ring of Brodgar and these and these types of sites, um, and where you don't necessarily find burials, right? But you find megaliths, big stones, 
the the burial the also another landscape that you can think of is woodhenge the woodhenges and seahenge basically where where people um are using timber to try and connect with the past and whatever they're trying to connect with whatever they're trying to look at and interpret right so that not that's not necessarily burial right but what could be very much burial is is seeing for example if we move this here we we might be thinking for example about west kennet long barrow we might be thinking um of what's indicated as a chamber at castle rig uh, we might be thinking of some of the great um chambers on the isle of orkney uh, in the vale of Glamorgan, places like um places like tinkers with burial chambers so on Th those 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 are classically um classed as burial chambers however as i've said to you before lots of these sites see indications of burial years after uh, they were originally constructed so what are they when we look at places like uh, newgrange or island so you you know you've got lots of different sort of contradictions but one site that we will come on to which i get very excited with are places known as causeway enclosures and what causeway enclosures are is a collection of it, it, within it within a circle right but that circle itself is made up of a ditch a causeway a ditch a causeway in a circle, right? Hence a causeway enclosure. So each of these ditches have a special meaning. And what we do know is each of these dishes, ditches, whether in the past or they still do contain sets of human remains in one form or another. So that sort of very much um, gives you a little bit of an overview about your burial landscape. It's a lot more complicated than that. And something else that will blow your mind. And the other bit of the landscape, which I find is much more interesting than any of this, is actually, hang on a minute, number four. The landscape, which I would call the land of the ancestors. And what do we mean by this? Well, Land of the Ancestors. What, what is that? What is that? Well, Land of the Ancestors are parts of our landscape that almost seemingly people actually in the flesh never ever went, right? Um, and places such as, if we want to think of it, places such as Cursus monuments, hang on a bit. Cursus monuments, such as avenues, such as bank barrows. All of these have a place in our landscape of places that are landscape, that places that our ancestors would dwell. Right? So if we want to go off that now and stop the sharing, one, one thing I think is very much intriguing is that, is that our Neolithic world is a lot more complicated than, than anything before and anything that would really come after. It had certain rules and it was a, a complicated landscape, a very diverse landscape over a very, very long period of time. And there are lots of things going on over a very, very long period of time. So the one, the one problem that I find when we're looking at the Neolithic landscape is that what people have a habit of doing, they, they okay, let, let's just, um, I'm pretty sure I didn't want to use this image, but I have to refine it. So I'm just going um, to, I want to show you, I want to make this point now. So if we, if we go to here, uh, and we go to here. Hang on a minute. Uh, let's just grab. 
let's grab that. So what what you, what you can see? Oh, that one's a bit more clearer when it comes up on the screen. Oh, is that coming up as clear? No, it's not. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Let's do this. Put that up as clear. Come on. Hang on a bit. Where's that little map? Out there. Okay. This this is this is Avery, right? Um, uh, one one thing about Avery is that. Uh, Everything that's going on at Apri has developed um, and evolved, evolved over a very, very long period of time. Nothing ever at Avery um, was probably planned in a way that somebody thought, right, in a thousand years' time, what we're going to do, we're going to have all these stones, and what we're going to do, we're going to have this going on and that going on. So what's going on in the Neolithic period is that there are great changes. There, there are great changes in how people go about um, whatever they're doing at Avebury. So what I'd like to do is I would like to I'd like to get on to one of the one of the one of the bits that I that I mentioned earlier on. They're known as bank barrows, right? So bank barrows, bank barrows comes into your classic classification four, right? And of obviously a place of our uh, the place of our ancestors, land of our ancestors, right? But before we but before we mention anything else, right? I want to take you on a little bit of a journey, right? We don't need any images of this, and we will be cover, covering one of these sites as well. Souterrains, they've got souterrain souterrains on the island of Orkney, right? And they've got souterrains elsewhere. And what a souterrain is, they're, they're holes in the ground, right? And, and they're, they're very strange things. I've got uh, quite a few images of them. So when we do souterrains, I, we can look at a load of images, right? And what, what it is, did, Peter, did you go down in a souterrain with me? Is he there? No, he's muted. Silly sorry. Microphone switched off. Yeah. Yes, I, yes, we did. Right. Okay. And Before you, I you said crawled it, along the entrance tunnel, and one of the girls right. chucked stones at you. <clears throat> yeah, that makes sense. But yeah, uh, well, we did go down in. But the, 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 what I was trying to say, the rooms, and we, we we were able to go down into the souterrain, which we believe was would have been roofed at some point, and we were actually underground, and then. Uh, there was an entrance tunnel, which was just a, a couple of yards away. Yeah. To an opening whereby it, that would have been the actual entrance to it. And I crawled into it. You did. As I do. Right. Um, ba ba basically, uh, basically a souterrain, um, a very, very strange structures. And, um, and with some, lots of the ones I've been into, you get, they they built steps going into them, yeah. and uh, what you've got is is a chamber, and you've usually got a, cor a a corridor going off, and it goes into another chamber, right? Now, there's lots of descriptions of what these were used for, and one thing one thing that we usually find is that archaeologists say, "Oh, right, these these souterrains were used for this, and they were used for that." The answer is that they may have been used for lots of different things over a long period of time. The ones we were looking no. at, we thought they were probably used for storage. Yes. But then again, other people have other descriptions. Yeah. And one, one of the descriptions are, is when you look at some of these souterrains, souterrains uh, you've got little holes that have been left in, in the stonework of, around the outside of these souterrains underground. And archaeologists have thought, why, 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 why aren't they filled in? You know, what's going on? Um, and then one or two archaeologists were starting to come up with the idea that they, they, they were used as places that you could speak to the ancestors, right? Um, so, so in other words, you, you, you'd get like a quarried out sort of hole in the ground and they would leave little holes that, that sort of go into the rock, right? Or, or, or if it's stone that they've lined this with, they would leave these little holes, right? So one or two archaeologists are actually saying, oh, what, what these are, uh, a sort of places that you, you would actually go down 
uh, and you'd actually speak into these holes. You would shout and scream into these holes and whatever. And there were places that you'd speak to the ancestors, right? So again, this idea that people spoke to their ancestors um, um, and their ancestors went to special places were very different places where they than where they put the bones. So so in modern day society, in some modern day societies, you would bury somebody and then you'd visit the grave or you'd visit the the Croatia, right? Well, then they said, oh, well, we'll put the bones over there, but the, our ancestors are over there. So they, they would go over there and speak to their ancestors over there and the bones would be left over there. So that's the principle. So that's what I'd like to do now. I'd like to look at bank barrows or make a little bit of a start on bank barrows. Now, now when we look at our book, uh, which is Ancient Britain, there is a simple mention about a bank barrow. It says that Neolithic bank barrows found in Dorset. And that's basically what we got. So therefore, we're going to dig a little bit deeper. And what I'm going to do is show you an image of a bank barrow. And that's where we're going to go. And we'll have a little bit of a discussion about this. And then we'll take a break. Oh. Mm. Said bank barrow. This is actually the broad main bank barrow um, in actually Dorset, this one. So what we what we've got we've got a, a nice little bit of, bit of a description about this broad main bank barrel which i which i might sort of look in a lot more detail today um and sort of try to get some little answers but what we need to do is we need to talk about what these bank barrows are or what they could be and give some information about them so what they are as you can clearly see from that image is that they take the form of a long, sinuous, parallel sided mound. And that looks that looks fairly that that looks sort of um, um, uniform in height and width and, and usually flanked with a ditch on either side. And the one thing that we get about these bank barrows is that they are some of the earliest monuments that we find on our landscape from the Neolithic period. They are really strange things. And in lots of cases, when they're excavated, they find nothing in them. They may be the result of a single phase of construction. So basically there, there was this craze this one time and what they decided to do was build this bank, hence, bank barrow so whenever whenever we use the word barrow we we always presume it refers to a burial right we we always we always think oh it, it's it's to do with a burial right but it it's 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 a barrow it, it's you know it it's it doesn't necessarily mean to be associated um with a burial what we do find is that some of these bar barrows, and we know of probably between 10 and 20 of them across Britain, and they're mainly in the south, there's one or two up north. Um, so they may have actually been added to. But what we do know is that in later periods, barrows are, are then built in and around this landscape of these bank barrows. So let's look at another little bit of an image. Uh, there we go. Not that. Just go. Uh, there, there's, there's the uh, broad main one again from above. And those other two monuments have been added. So although the burials have been found um, alongside the bank barrow, they are obviously uh, associated with another period in that landscape's time. They might date from the early Neolith Neolithic period or they might date from the ne middle Neolithic period, but they're certainly not used or, or built anymore later on. So... 
what well, this is one description. There, there's there's one in a place known as Pentridge in Dorset. This is a little bit of description of it. The barrow comprises two distinct parts, the tall and narrower part now tree covered. Um, and these these parts have been joined together, one being 50 meters and one being 90 meters long. Um, and the very strange thing with these with these barrows themselves, um, they're all that they're, they're simply made of earth. Um, and it's trying to work out what they really, really mean. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to look at a look at um, a couple more images, and then what we'll do is we'll take a little bit of a break. There, there's our broad mean one. It's sort of no non-distinct uh, as as sort of a monument, and there's another one. That little bit of a trail there, that little bit of a sign there, the long bready bank barrow, um, and this one itself is. I do believe this is the, the Long Bready Bank Barrow as well. You can see a distinctive mound, right? And this is what these are. So what I'd like to do is specifically look at one of these barrows, right? And it's in fact back to this one again. Okay, this this is our this is our one um, that, that we're going to look at now, the broad main one. And interestingly enough, they were identified as separate monuments in 1938 when a survey was made of archaeological sites by a Northern Surveyor, surveyor known as OGS Crawford. And OGS Crawford, um, there were different names given these for these things, but they're now known as bank barrows. They were known as ridge barrows. Um, they were known as ridge mounds. They were known as barrow banks. But now we know them as bank barrows. So the, the one thing the one thing that we can say is very interestingly associated with what English heritage says about these things. So obviously not too many up north. I think, as I say, I think there's one or two up north, and not that I'm really aware of any in Wales. But English heritage says that these bank barrows um form part of then a then a very mixed a very complicated burial landscape afterwards so what we're talking about is initially these may have been monuments for the our ancestors and later on they become um they're within a landscape um that lots of burials have been placed in and around so what they can say is this in particular one they they found that this itself was built for a specific reason at a specific time, and it's a specific monument. And what what they are starting to see is that these are very vulnerable. They're very difficult to manage. And what we have got now is a little bit of an in-depth um, interpretation of what these bank barrows possibly are or possibly what they're not. But at that moment, we're going to take a little bit of a break. So um, let's see. Let's see where we are. Right. Anyone want to ask anything at this stage? Uh, David? No, thanks. Margaret? Um, I've got a book about Avery here from our library. I always thought of enclosures being circular, but they illustrate rectangular ones here. That, the thing is, they, enclosures can be any size. If they if they enclose, they can be at any size. Mm. Uh, and and the the idea of an enclosure uh, is is the bank barrow itself is enclosed in whatever is inside, which is usually nothing. Mm. Avery had the long uh, the, the long avenue leading to it, didn't it? But that that is not a bank barrow. It, it's an uh, avenue. Well, that led to the bank barrow, didn't it? Uh, no, that led to no, no. Hang on, that <laughs> led close to Long Kennet, um, Long Kennet Barrow, which is a burial monument. These bank barrows are not burial monuments. They're very, very different. Right. Anything you'd like to say, Anne? Yeah, thank you. Quite interesting. How's it going? What about you, Jeannie? Oh, thank you. 
No, thank you. Okay. Very curious. Yes, and we've done, Margaret, yeah? Yeah. We better not leave anybody out. <laughs> One of the main um, things of Avery was the uh, fer fertility uh, enclosure, wasn't it? Uh, and the shapes of the stones. Yeah. So okay, then what we'll, what we'll do? We'll take a break now, and we'll uh, we'll go from there. We'll see okay. you back in about uh, about twelve minutes or so. Okay. Yep. Okay. Oh, I think you're managing to keep warm, David. Pardon? I think you're managing to keep warm with your blanket. That's a good Thank one. You. Not very successfully. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
I haven't got any heating in here. Haven't you? Well, I've, I've got one radiator on, but not the one near me, so I've just turned the one off and put the other one on because I'm only I'm doing, you know, a couple of radiators in the house. Yeah. <laughs> We're all being very careful this year, haven't we? I suppose in the past yeah. we weren't sort of uh, aware of things. Oh, it's warming up now, this radiator that's behind me. So it was cold. So, and the other one I've put off the other side of the room. I ought to put it off in a few minutes because then it'll be staying warm enough till I go to bed. <laughs> And I'm all into hot water bottles these days as well, which, oh, yeah. which I didn't, didn't used to use so much. But it's sort of uh, looking at all sorts of ways of keeping warm. And like you, if I'm watching, if I'm watching telly in the evening, I'll, I'll put the heating off and wrap myself up in a blanket on the settee to watch it. So, so we're all we're all trying. This one actually plugged into the electric. Oh, it's an electric blanket, is it? Now, mine's um, just... I haven't to... tried it yet, but that's what it does. What other schemes have you got to keep warm, David? Have you got any other things you do, tips you could give out? Say it again. Say, have you got any other tips you can give out about how to keep warm? <laughs> Go to <laughs> bed all day. <laughs> that's stay in bed. Oh, no, no, that's not very good. Do you know, I sometimes find if I'm getting cold, um, and I think oh, I'll put the heating on. If I go out a brisk walk, I'll come back and I'm warm. <laughs> it's just yeah. So sometimes just moving helps a bit. And of course, hot, hot drinks as well help, don't they? <laughs> Hot drinks, hot water bottles, blankets. Nice mug of cocoa. Yeah, that's all I've got. I've got a cup of cocoa here. With a, it's a weakish cocoa with no milk in. So, oh. So, and I, I, and I've, I tried one. I didn't think I'd like it at all because I know years ago I had cocoa, didn't like it. But I've got used to not having anything sweet. So it's, yeah, it's all right. Well, it's only sweet if you put sugar in it. 
Yeah, but I used to always have sugar in it because I didn't like oh, yeah. it. We, we, yeah. You know, I really didn't like it. Needed sugar no. when I was younger. You know, I mean, a lot younger. Um, but I'm finding now I can drink it without the sugar, so it's fine. I always would make it with milk. You make it with milk? Oh, yeah. It's one of my... Um, you know, That's cocoa sudden. as opposed to drinking chocolate. Pardon? A cocoa, cocoa yeah. as well, opposed co to drinking yeah, chocolate. Drinking chocolate's full of sugar, isn't it? Cocoa yeah. isn't. Yeah, and right. this, is, this is cocoa. But this is part of my... You know, I've been learning a lot about uh, food and nutrients. This is all part of the changes I'm instilling in my diet to you know, ward off the horrible things that I've got coming at my age, and you must have things at your age as well. These awful, you know, new needs well, and hearing aids and all the rest of it. <laughs> my diet is probably a bit boring. I have a, a bit of grilled meat with some steamed mixed vegetables, peas, carrots, sweet corn, and they're, they're steamed very quickly in the microwave. Yeah, yeah. In a little pressure pot. Yeah. And uh, the three minutes and they're done. Yeah. And the meat then is usually griddled on a griddle. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I have that one day. Next day I have fish. Mm -hmm. Fish and fish and the mixed veg. Beef and beef, meat and mixed veg. And that's more or less my boring diet for the week. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I mean, I think that's very good. It's a good diet. That I have the same. I eat uh, fish and uh, I had fish tonight. Um, a kipper, actually, tonight. <laughs> but different kinds of fish. Uh, but what I have been doing is exploring all different kinds of vegetables and a much bigger variety of vegetables. Than I've always eaten vegetables. I'm eating a lot bigger variety now to, you know, try to... I like the Iceland mixed vegetables, as I say, the carrots, peas, beans and uh, sweet mm. corn, all, all mixed together. Yeah. Well, I had an aubergine yesterday. Oh, right. Right. I just... It was just slit and baked in the oven with tomatoes on and then cheese on top of that. Two different kinds of cheese and baked. It was absolutely delicious. So what I'm saying, I'm trying, I mean, I, aubergine is, is a, a, a vegetable I haven't had much of. And I'm trying to try all new new vegetables. And so, but, um, as I say, but what, if you're having a mixed vegetable, that's, that's, you, you can't do much better than that. That's a good diet. Oh, well, that's the way I, I look at it, yeah. Good diet. Keeps me regular. <laughs> <laughs> what you don't want, though, is, is the, um, the the white bread or anything like that. That's. Uh, I make my own bread. Yes, I do, too. Yeah, I haven't bought bread for ooh, a few years. I, I, I gave up my um, sourdough starter because I was doing that for a long time and really liked mm. that bread. And then, because I've cut my bread down a bit, it, it, it was a lot of trouble keeping the starter going if you're not using it to make the bread. Anyway, recently I've found out you can freeze the starter. So I've got a oh. new starter. Well, I'm making it. It's, yeah. it's ah, just right. building up now. So I should be able to do that soon. Well, I'm using a little bread machine. I'm cheating. Oh, yeah. No, I've got, I've got a bread machine. But if I know sourdough, I don't have to do that by hand. Yeah. But I can yeah. stick, a, 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 say, a whole meal in the, in the bread machine. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. My favourite, actually, is uh, malted grain mm -hmm. and white, half and half. Yeah. And that, I that think makes my favourite nice is love. sourdough. I really like a sourdough. Yeah, well, there we are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they're all... It's what I mean, you like. As I say, it's what you like, as long as you're eating it healthy. I mean, the white well, yeah. stuff, especially the white in plastic bags, is <laughs> terrible. Not worth eating at all. <laughs> no, I've been quite a... I used to do, for years, I've done a lot of craft, and suddenly I'm off the craft. I'm all into this cooking, you know, finding all these different <laughs> things to cook and ways of cooking them. Still, I've got to get back to the craft. I was trying to do some today, and it all went wrong. And oh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid. Yes, I'm not doing where I used to do a lot. Of, I, 
model, building model boats and all sorts. Yeah. I've got three almost complete model boats. Mm -hmm. But I don't seem to get the enthusiasm to go and finish them off. I don't that, know. That's how I am. I'm saying, even as I've lost the, you know, the drive to do it, I used to yeah. like, do an awful well, that's, lot of that's right, yeah, me. Yeah. Suddenly, I've suddenly found it's uh, it's almost like a chore to have to start them, and yet I used to spend <laughs> so much time and love doing it. I don't know. May, I'm oh, hoping yeah. it'll come back because I haven't given all my stuff. I've, I've still got a room full of rubbish, you know, that you collect when you do crop. A small room full of rubbish. So I'm keeping that in the hope that the uh, enthusiasm comes back. <laughs> well, why, why didn't why didn't you have like um you, you could get all your model boats and you could have a sinking session? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, right, bank barrows. Right, let's go for it. Right, let's get get into this one. Uh, right, where are we? Do do do. La, 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 la. Right. Um, da, da, da. Um, da, 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 da. Okay. Can you okay. tell me again what is a bank barrow? What what was its purpose? Ah, that's what we're going to go into. Right, but before, but we're going to we'll put this in here a minute, actually. Um, and this this is well. Um, we we we've digressed a tiny little bit from a bank barrow a minute, right? Um, but this will sort of lead us back in a moment. It, it's um, th this is this is the thing that the you know that that that's that's the that's the thing. Um, it, it's it's fitting a monument into um, a, a category um, and trying to understand uh, what it was possibly used for. And this, this is probably what we're going to try and do today because I got a, a, a big chunky bit of text from uh, English Heritage, which we're going to try and wade through. And uh, they basically asked the question, what is a bank barrow? And hopefully we'll get some kind of answer. Now, a few moments ago, we were looking at dividing this Neolithic landscape. And I come across this little, this little chart and you can basically see here, it basically says, um, obviously all of these things here are obviously trees uh, and they're all over the place. And it defines that all these, all these sort of houchard sort of gray black areas are where we've actually come across Neolithic activity and lots of it. And you can see that there is lots going on um, in the Neolithic period, basically all over the place, but little pockets everywhere. What, this is one of the things that we don't find is Neolithic activity everywhere all over Britain, simply because there were lots of those um, primeval woodlands and forests. So that meant it precluded lots of sort of activity within the Neolithic period. But what we do know um, is as the, as the um, Bronze Age is coming in um, around 4,100 years ago, what we do find is that large chunks of this landscape where trees are actually still standing in, in, in sort of multitudes, particularly in the upland areas, if the trees haven't already been cut down, what we're starting to see in uh, in this sort of um, Bronze Age, that those trees that had survived the Neolithic period, which have been quite a lot, were being really cut down in the upland areas, which then caused lots of the upland areas that once had trees, never to see trees returning again. Right, and you can basically see on here, you've obviously got Cumbria there, and you've got Dartmoor and Exmoor, and you've got the Cambrian Mountains, Wales. Um, and it sort of gives you an idea. Um, and this is, this is a rather interesting. It sort of shows all the little black ones that indicate where you've got lots of Mesolithic activity. And obviously, um, as, as, the, as the Neolithic comes on, you get more and more activity over larger areas of, larger areas of the country. 
And one one point two actually be made as well is that what what we do see with the Neolithic period is that um, the coastline of Britain starts to actually start to get to the state that it would be now. So in other words, what we're talking about is is the map uh, that we'd refer to as Britain today um, is is getting um, that way in the Neolithic period. Obviously, there's large tracts that, that, that are boggy and sort of not been reclaimed yet or, or anything like, like the sort of uh, the wash and sort of East Anglia and so on. But things that are starting to get to the shape that we understand Great Britain as today. And we so seem to be following rivers like the Thames. Yes. Yes. Very good point. So what what we want to do is again this sort of the, the these types of sites here so we got um if the, the site we're actually looking for is broad main bank barrow and there are lots of images out there about it it's, it's probably one of the one of the more famous ones um and sort of giving you an idea of this sort of this rather interesting monument and the bank bar was actually what what's in front of us um, on the screen. So I've got I've got this um, I've got this this paper from um, English Heritage, and it basically <laughs> it basically discusses lots of things. Actually, it's actually fascinating. Um, and I come across it when I when I was searching for information on bank barrows, um, and it was sort of um, it sort of looked in great detail how bank barrows link to the rest of the landscape and what they might be and, and what they could mean and all these types of things. And there's a lot of information um, in regards to these bank barrows. Well, the one up the broad main itself happened to be um, really starting to be interpreted in 2000 by English heritage. Um, and lots of the, lots of the, uh, bank barrows that we do find in Britain are actually protected ancient monuments because there's not a lot of them. So the broad main bank barrow sits um, around 142 metres above ordnance datum. So they're sort of showing well out on the landscape of Dorset. And sort of, um, sort of standing out as being a very important monument um, that, that can be seen for miles around. Uh, one, one, of the, one of the localities that we do see um, with <laughs> this type of monument is, is actually um, um, trying to sort of interpret exactly what they mean. Uh, for a very, very long time, they were just marked on maps as, as dikes. So I couldn't share the information that I've got in front of me um, on this on the this other device so i'm probably gonna have to come off a minute and sort of give you an idea that over time different types of monuments are understood um and interpreted i know uh, i don't know if we if if we mentioned last week well, i know we mentioned last week about silbury hill did we mention um marlborough hill last week did we mention that one no can anyone? Okay, right. Okay. And this is this is one of the things about Neolithic archaeology that um, it, it's it's trying to discover things that people have thought as something else. So Silbury Hill might have been thought as some kind of burial mound, but Marlborough Mound, which is in the middle of the um, village, well, the town of Marlborough in Wiltshire, that there's there's a mound, and that mound in that, that oh okay I'll, I'll show you it this is pointless me um trying to describe that one i'll just show you it now okay um if we type in if we go there um uh, and we type in marlborough 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 mound and this will this will be another site that we'll be looking at in great detail. 
for many generations, there it is. There's, there's loads of indications there. For many generations, this this mound itself was believed to have been built by the um, was was thought to have been built by the Normans, right? And everybody thought that it, it's obviously a Norman mound, and nobody questioned it. And it had a, a Norman tower on top of it. But now we're starting to now we're starting to look at this and work out that the mound is thousands of years older than when it was thought to have been built. It's actually a mound which is very similar to Sil Silbury Hill, right? So, so when when we look at the landscape, we might actually have prehistoric monuments that are thought to be one thing and then turn out to be another. In fact, that's a really interesting point because when we think about the the Norman world, we we always think that um, when people put labels on things on the map, they they always think that um, you know, wow, uh, this is this was built at a certain period in time. A uh, one site that I was not going to do today, uh, which I did look up earlier on, which now. Um, expresses a point of view that I'm trying to give is this place. It's the place known as Old Sarum. Old Sarum itself actually started out as a um, as an Iron Age site. The exterior bank there is is Iron Age, right? And when people looked at this, they they said, "Oh, wow! This 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 site itself." Um, the the Norman built this sort of big long this big donut, right, with a mound in the middle, right, and 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 that's but in fact that was already there before the Normans got there. The actual exterior bank and the ditch were already there. So what the Normans simply did was come in, build another bank and a ditch on the inside, have some kind of castle on the inside, and then around the outside, what they did with again old Sam that that's in Wiltshire as well. What, what what they did was simply um, use it as a medieval town. The problem is use it, the problem is is after a while the medieval town got so so big. Um, there was actually um, an image here a second ago. Hang on, where, where is it? Hang on, uh, fiddlesticks. Oh, there we go. There we go. You, you can you can imagine that this is this is itself um, this itself is a medieval town which had been built associated on directly on top of an Iron Age site, and then suddenly it turned out that they, it was just too it was too small to put everything. So what they decided in the medieval period decided to take down the cathedral and actually decided to build it in modern um, um, Salisbury, right? So that would be New Sarum. So this is old Sarum. So they decided to take down lots of the buildings and rebuild them somewhere else. The point I'm trying to make, this is the point I'm trying to make, is that just because things look like they're a certain period on the map doesn't mean to say that they're not actually older, right? Because um, another site that, that comes into that category uh, is Stonehenge. Because initially... Stonehenge was actually a causeway enclosure. Um, what it turned out to be um, was was a load was a, was was a collection of ditches, uh, which were eventually added together, and that was about six thousand years ago. And as Stonehenge developed, it developed into um, it developed into what what we're seeing today, right? Um, and again, with somewhere like Stonehenge. It developed over a very, very long period of time. In fact, Stonehenge developed over a period of around two and a half thousand years, which is an incredible length of time for a monument to develop. But it originally started off as a Neolithic burial monument, and then it turned into be the monument that we're actually seeing at Stonehenge today. Anyway, back to back to our site here, which is this monument. And if you if you go and you can see lots of you can find lots of information about this. So if we type in the word plan, <coughs> what the hell was that? Was that a strange creature? 
Mm. That sounded like a strange creature, though. It was just David coughing. I thought that was Anne. You was that Anne? You can't blame Anne for everything. <laughs> it wasn't me, no. <laughs> yeah, but that was Anne. That really wasn't David. Quiet. It was David coughing. It wasn't David, it was Anne. It was me. Oh, it was you. Oh, right. I apologize. Okay. <laughs> oh, don't worry, David. It's fine. That was just very strange. Um, so when this is this is the plan that we that we want to look at, is, is that this is a little bit of a map. This is actually the Ordnance Survey map dated to 1890. And you can clearly see on that map that it, it actually shows. And it's not very clear, actually. It actually shows that the monument that we're looking at, the, the bank barrow, is actually clearly shown on here uh, as a dike, right? A dike as in a bank. Now, that's another confusing thing. When, when, you, when you see the word dike um, on the map, some people think it's a ditch and other people think it's a bank, right? So, so naturally, what people thought was a dike that could have possibly been created in the early medieval period actually turned out to be something completely and utterly different. It turned out to be a bank. Now, the one thing that we, we clearly know about this bank barrow is that the bank barrow within the landscape is the earliest possible barrow on the landscape very, very earliest possible barrow on the landscape. So it's one of the earliest monuments on the landscape. This is the point I wanted to make, that the bank barrows are some of the, some of the earliest of the monuments before anything else. So in other words, what we then talk about then is, is the nature of how monuments develop on the landscape. Right. So we might need to have a little bit of a pen at this point, right, um, to try and get an idea and answer Margaret's question, seeking answering Margaret's question. What is, in fact, a bank barrow? Right. And hopefully we'll be able to answer it in a few moments. But by doing that, we need to understand what types of monuments exist within the landscape at certain moments in time. In our minds, it's a particular jumble, right? So that's what we've got to do next. Before we can do anything more, that's where we need to go. So I need to stop. I need to get off this screen a minute. And what I need to do is I need to blame Anne for being quiet. And you've got to be blamed for something. So what we're talking about is approximately 8,000 years ago to 4,500 years ago, David and everybody else. That is, in fact, our Neolithic period. We've established that. A few moments ago, did we not tell us that there were certain monuments on our landscape, right? And what we're going to do is we're just going to talk about what the earth, some of the earliest monuments were, right? So what we can what we can clearly say is at least by about six and a half thousand years ago, maybe earlier, what we've got is monuments caused, cause, weighed, enclosures. That comes into the category of some of our earliest monuments on the landscape. And as I mentioned earlier on, causeway enclosures are a, um, a number of concentric circles with ditches, causeway, uh, a ditch, causeway, ditch, causeway, um, in a complete circle, right? We call them a string of sausages. So those, so what is a causeway enclosure in a nutshell? A causeway enclosure is a monument where you would, in the center of the monument, have a platform. And on that monument, 
you would place a set of human remains. And over a period of time, that human remains would decay and be eaten upon, e eaten, eaten, eaten upon, eaten upon, and preyed upon by various birds and animals. And then bones themselves would fall to the ground from that platform, and then those bones would be collected together and put into the ditches. That's just an overview of causeway enclosures. But it's a lot more complicated than that. Next. So what is a causeway enclosure? It's part of our burial landscape. It's part of our landscape number three. That's part of our burial landscape. So then what we then look at is what we're going to do. Some of the earliest monuments within the land of the ancestor monuments are in fact bank barrows. So there we go. Let's put a few, let's put the word bank barrow in there. And what we do find as we'll come across this description that we'll come across after I've done this little sort of um, interpretation is that we've got a very interesting one at Maiden Castle. Where a Maiden Castle, as we're all aware of, is the location of a great Iron Age site in Dorset. However, initially, Maiden Castle had a bank barrow running across it and eventually become an Iron Age hill fort. So what we're talking about is this is one of the earliest types of monument that we find within our landscape. And usually we find nothing in them when they're excavated. So the sense of earth and a bank being created is maybe something that we'd interpret that mm -hmm. it's a place that our ancestors would go to. Because with the absence of artifacts, why were they constructed? Uh, what, what do gods need? What do our ancestors need? They need nothing because they're ancestors. They live in the bank. They live in the barrow. That's what, who, which creatures live in barrows? Rabbits, bank barrow. Hence why we got the name. So we're making this very, very simplified, but it really helps us to understand where we are. And then what we, then what we start to see developing uh, into the Neolithic period, at least 6,000 years ago, is what we do start to find then. Because what happens is bank barrows, we don't really see bank barrows being created anymore. And we also don't see causeway enclosures being created anymore. So what takes their place are monuments like our long barrows. And the long barrows, you could say, um, in their later stages, we use for burial. So that's part of our, I'm going to say, our landscape of our ancestors and part of our landscape of our burials. Now, very interesting type of monument in all of this is our circular monuments. And those circular monuments themselves come in the form of what we would call stone circles. And wood circles. You do get wood circles and stone circles spread all the way across Britain. Um, one thing that I didn't say about causeway enclosures, and one thing I didn't say about bank barrows, is most of the bank barrow type monuments are actually in the south. We, I think we've got one or two further up north, but that's it. Um, and basically, causeway enclosures, we do find maybe one or two in Scotland, one or two in Wales, but mainly spread throughout sort of southern and mid part of England. That's where we find our causeway and enclosures. Stone circles, we find them everywhere, don't we? From Cumbria, all the way up to Orkney, all the way up to Cornwall, all the way across the country. And where there's an absence of stones, what we do find is wood circles, wood hinges. Ah, oh, what is a henge monument? Well, sort of a henge monument is a bit of an evolution from possibly those causeway enclosures. But we'll come on to that another day. But they, those henge monuments usually come into the time of the stone circles and um, wooden henges. One thing that we can say is the stone circles really go all the way into the Bronze Age. So they're monuments that keep going and keep going and keep going and keep going. So out of the, out of the things that actually survive within our landscape, we've got our stone circle monuments. And those long barrows um, and those long barrows and various chambers 
a very, very interesting monument. So, okay, if we want to get rid of that minute, so let's just sort of about think about our uh, long barrows, um, and we think, for example, uh, our chambered monuments, our chambered monuments, um, they're, they're, they're very interesting structures. So we start to see them about 6,000, 6,500 years ago, and they come all the way into, um, into use into about 4,500 years ago, maybe 4,100 years ago, and they fall out of use. Damn them, they fall out of use, simply because what our ancestors used the landscape for is very, very different. Whoa, oh, we do have actually forgotten one important type of monument. We've got lots of types of monuments, but one thing we haven't forgotten is in fact, cursus and avenue monuments. And we're gonna have lots of fun with them over the next few months. So we've mentioned, um, we, we had a quick chat about them earlier on, didn't we? We, we mentioned avenues um, and we mentioned the cursus uh, monuments. Now we usually sign avenues and cursus monuments directly associated with stone hinges. Um, in, in the sense of avenues, stone avenues of stones. Oh. But Cursus monuments are rather very strange monuments indeed. Cursus monuments are in some ways the most unusual monument of the Neolithic period, and at least, um, and, and at least the ones that are most misunderstood, those Cursus monuments. They consist of two parallel long banked ditches with internal banks running from running over some distance, going over through valleys, going up onto the tops of hills, all sorts of things. Very, very interesting things. But I'm sure we'll have a lot to say when we look at Cursus monuments. So hopefully that might answer some of wonderful Margaret's questions. But we haven't actually finished at Broad Main yet. So what we need to do, we need to get off this bit of a screen share here. Yeah? We need to get back and we look, need to look at Broad Main again. Let's go back there. And what we're going to do, we're going to make sure that Anne is asked the questions this week. I hope you're getting your questions ready, Anne. Um, not one yet. Maybe a lot will have come <laughs> drift into my head. We're going to leave this image up here, right? And we're going to leave this image up here because what we've got, we've got this sort of long linear bank here and we've got the mounds. We've got, we've got other mounds within this landscape. Now that's rather interesting. So if we go back to this English, English heritage paper, um, it mentions as these barrows at least dating from somewhere in the region of three and a half, uh, um, start again, um, five and a half thousand to about 6,000 and beyond, right? Um, and the one at Maiden Castle really belongs to a time period of at least 5,600 years ago. So it's again, one of the earlier monuments and even longer than that. So, this this mound this mound itself is is within a landscape of of a large number of later um, clusters. It said, <laughs> as I have a cough, clusters of Bronze Age burial monuments, right? And there they are. And it's almost as if there's also one thing that we can say about these these um, these bank barrows is that over time, over time, monuments themselves, monuments themselves from later periods want to be associated with it. Um, and it basically says that most of the bank is no more than about half a meter in height, um, but it goes for a length of about 250 meters. So it's quite a length. Um, for the majority of its length, it's got a it's got a width of between fourteen and eighteen meters in width. 
Some of it stands at um, no more than half a meter in height, but some of it, there are bits that go up to maybe two meters in height. So it's still sort of showing out within the landscape. On closer examination, the mound can be seen to consist more or less of a, a flat platform. Rather, rather interesting. Um, and, um, and it might not see it now. And this might due to be down to disturbance. Over its length, it sort of undulates. Um, and it's presumably it undulates because people have tried digging into it. And people have tried trying to understand what this is. So there's considerable damage within this monument. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's, that, it's that thing that people really wished to try and understand what's going on with this monument. However, one thing that we've completely missed is there's a ditch around it as well. There's only parts of the ditch around this, but we do believe that there was a ditch all the way around it. And this is where we come into interpretation. And I'm sure you would like a bit of interpretation. And Margaret, here we go. Right, let's, let's go on to the interpretation of what these bank barrows might actually mean. So let's get off this. I need to get on top of drawing one of my really crappy little plans, okay? Um, and I don't think anybody's impressed by these, these little um, drawings that I do. Hang on a minute, cancel that. Let's get in there um, and let's do the whiteboard. Right, so mostly, so we've established this already, um, that this one here, and what I would like to do is describe the one at Maiden Castle and show your plan of Maiden Castle if we've got time. Um, I'm probably gonna, well, before we do that, I'm gonna probably, probably take a little bit of a break but uh, what I would like to do is give you a little bit of the interpretation of what these bank barrows might mean so what do we know about the Margaret with when they've been examined there's no burials associated with the original creations of these bank barrows if there are any burials associated with them they've been placed in later on so whatever that means is something different from the inter original interpretation of what these bank barrows meant right okay Stop prevaricating. So if we can think of a long sort of weird, oh, hang on a minute, that didn't turn out well, did it? Okay, so what we can think of, if we go to maybe something like that. And what you then have is a ditch around the whole thing. And they built these things, right? But I'm going to get very, very deep. So if we do a cross section across this, A, B, and C, and we go with the description of broad main, because some of them are sort of um, oval on top, but we'd say the one that that we that we know of um, at broad main is, is a little bit sort of. Um, it's mentioned it being a little bit flat, but we, we don't really know that. So if we if we go with this, right? And what what I, I, I have you got your mic off, Margaret? Because I'm going to need to use you, Margaret. Yeah. Right. Are you ready? Okay. Here we go. Right. So we, we we've moved this a bit. So basically, what it is, Margaret, we got this. That's the ditch and that's the mound, yeah. And another ditch. Right, okay, Margaret. Right, let's do it. Now, the year is 6,000 years ago, okay? Mm -hmm. There's me. And there's you. Mm. All right? So, obviously, actually, at Margaret, it's a bit taller than this. Hang on a minute. We've not given it justice, right? That means that we're giants, right? So let's just sort of make this a bit bigger. About two foot high, are they? 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you uh, if you add another high. if you add another foot on for erosion or maybe two foot, so we, we, yeah, they're a bit taller than us. So okay, okay, Margaret, right? Um, there's a ditch and there's a bank. Is there anything stopping you from going down that ditch and up the bank and standing on top of it? Water, possibly. No, <laughs> no. no. It's well, well drained. It's a well drained chalky landscape. Okay. So uh, go on. Um, well, the mound is formed from the spoil of the ditch. Yeah, taken out of the ditch, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Um, but we just don't know why. Why? But and they, they was, we, they we was, hang on. Hang, sorry to interrupt, Margaret. Um, we don't know why, but they did. Right. Just keep going with your train of thought. Is there anything? St right. Let, let's draw this a little bit better. Actually, let's just get rid of that a minute. Right. Let's just just sort of um, let's try and draw this a little bit better. OK, so we've got this here. Right. There's us two there. Right. Now, this is my this is my thing. Right? And I want to see if you agree with it. Right. The ditch in the bank. Um, is there you can go south of it and you can go north of it or you can go east or west of it or depend on which side you are right but you've got this long elongated sort of sausage type thing across the landscape right now it's there for a reason um there's no housing within the landscape there's no other monuments within the landscape there's just this right where where our ancestors are, are somewhere over there right um where they're buried but where our ancestors go to is here Right. Um, and one, one of the things that we are finding is with these monuments, there's no artifacts with them at all. There's nothing. There, there's no initial artifacts with them at all. There's no pottery. There, there's no antlers. There's no um, lithics. There's no nothing. Right. Mm -hmm. And why would that be? Uh, that, that's a question that I'm going to leave with you in for a moment. I'll tell you what I, I think these bank barrows are. I, I feel that they're repositories of the ancestors. This, I, I, feel, I feel deeply that this is where our ancestors are going after they've left their mortal bodies. And the reason why there's no artifacts in these because they don't need these artifacts. Our people six, six and a half thousand, six thousand years ago, saw their world very different from us. They didn't see it materialistic. They didn't have much in the way of possessions. Um, thousand years earlier before that, most of these people, if they lived within the Doggerland landscape and they survived, lost everything. So in fact, possessions are not very important to these people. Ownership of the landscape is not important to these people. That's one key thing that will be coming up time and time again. Ownership of the landscape. In the early Neolithic period, nobody owned the landscape. The landscape believed it belonged to everybody. The reason why people were able to build great monuments is because there wasn't territory. The reason why the Dorset Cursus monument went in fact, nearly 10 kilometers across the landscape, down valley, uphill, down valley, through a water course, across a river, across a field, is because nobody owned the landscape. It belonged to all of us, right? So back to these, I, I really believe that they were places that our ancestors believed, uh, our, our ancestors believed that their ancestors went to. This is the land of their ancestors. This is the land of where their spirits of their loved ones went to. And that's why they that's why there's no artifacts there. And the other point as well is what's stopping us? What, what is stopping us? Well, the ditch for a start, the bank, another one. And we're not meant to go there. And in fact, this is, in fact, a metaphor for the woodlands and forests that you're not meant to go into. You could go into the forest, but you might not come out alive, right? You, you, you might be eaten. You might, you might sort of um, <clears throat> sprain your ankle and get trapped in amongst rocks because lots of the primeval woodland and, and forests were actually full of great boulders and rocks and all sorts of nasty holes and all sorts of things and lots of trees, right? So you don't really need to have barbed wire and electric fences to stop you going somewhere. 
you can just have a monument like this to stop you um, going on top of the mound. And the other thing as well is we don't find artifacts. So it obviously indicated their ancestors didn't go onto them. They didn't go anywhere near them. They just built them and left them. Right, Margaret, um, demolish everything I've said. No, my brain's hurting. I can't, I can't think. Yeah, a place of worship. <clears throat> anything else? I can't think of anything. Would it, being very basic, could it be an animal trap? Could it be... Um, There's no signs of any animals. There's no signs of anything like that. No, and they can't get up there because there's a ditch all the way round, not just on yeah. two sides, but all the way round, so they can't get up there. Uh, hang, on, hang on a minute, hang on a minute, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. You, you've used the word can't. They can, but the ditch is basically saying don't. Mm. Yeah, uh, don't. This is what I'm saying, don't. And have uh, these mounds been excavated? Uh, yes, you said they have, haven't they? The one at Maiden Castle has yeah. bits of it has, mm. right? Now, um, you know, that there is a point, there is a reason why we mentioned this so early on in our Neolithic stuff, right? And some of you must be thinking, oh, Carl has now lost the plot, right? But the reason why we mentioned this so early on, and I'll give you a demonstration of that now, all right? I'll give you a good demonstration of it, right? Um, we'll mention a little bit more about. Um, uh, broad main in a moment right um, and some of the other bits and pieces being said about them right uh which, which 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 i've which i do believe i've got here right so and then if we've got a few moments we we will see if we can um look at um the the archaeological evidence at maiden castle mm -hmm. right so if we go back um, and the point I wanted to make was this, okay? And it, it, we're going back to Stonehenge. We know we're going to go to Woodhenge. Um, to try and interpret these monuments, you've got to try and put a lot into it, right? So if we go to here, um, and we're going to go, we're going to show you, uh, we're going to go there. And we're going to go there and we're going to type in another type of monument, Woodhenge. I know your brain's hurting because there's a lot in this this week. Did you there say, are these um, uh, bank barrows, are they always near burial mounds? Event, uh, the, the, people, people put burial mounds with them later on. Oh, later, not at the same time. This is the point, Margaret, that this is a developing landscape. Mm. Right now, um, I don't know if any of you have ever been to Woodhenge, right? If you ever go to Woodhenge, um, it's very disappointing if you expect to see timbers sticking out the ground, right? Mm. What, what you do see is a load of concrete posts mm. sticking out the ground, right? And these concrete posts represent where they excavated timbers. Mm. Now, the Woodhenge monument probably roughly is somewhere around five and a half thousand, maybe 6,000, right? In and around these sort of bank barrows, right? So um, one, of, one of the things, if we, if we look at a bit of a reconstruction, there, okay? Mm -hmm. So the point is, Margaret, right? This is, this is what I would say. If you stood in the middle, right? In the very middle, it's very likely that the people outside would not be able to see you. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, if, if some of you are thinking, oh, what, what, the, what, the, what the hell is Carl on about with, with, with you know, um, a bank barrow being a repository of the ancestors? What the hell is he on about? But one of the things that we do know is that this is the type of thinking that we've got in the Neolithic period. Right, because if you think, um, one of the interpretations, if you think going further and further into this circle is a rite of passage. So if you're on the outside, you can't see what's going on in the inside. Agreed? That makes sense. Mm -hmm. That does make sense. If you're standing on the outside, the very outside, because of the way the timbers are organized, 
you can't really see what's going on in the inside. So the only way you can actually see what's going on in the inside is to move in amongst the concentric circles of these timbers. And eventually you'll be able to know what's going on in the inside. Right. Um, and one thing that we do feel, and this is something that um, my master's degree is, is in, is actually something called access analysis. The, the way you're able to see things and the way you're inter able to interpret things and the way you're able to go into a space and move and further and further into that space. Um, and as you keep going in, there's either more or less obstacles. So what we're talking about is, is this is an interpretation from above. You can see how all these concentric rings are actually organized, right? This is where they've got evidence of excavated timbers, right? So some of them are bigger, some of them are smaller. But what we are starting to think is that lots of this, lots of this Neolithic landscape is very mystical, um, is very is very sort of um, ascendancy led is sort of very much, if you're in the know, um, your understanding and knowledge is power in the Neolithic period. Actually, that's very odd me saying that mm. because I don't know, I'm picking on you a lot today, Margaret, but I don't know if you, 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 you use um, YouTube a lot, do you? Yeah, uh, yeah I do, yeah. Right, there, there's this guy who comes up on YouTube, he basically, he, you know, he's one of those people who, who wants you to make money out of YouTube. He's basically saying, if you come on my little sort of, oh, no, what he says, he says, um, um, use your knowledge to make a business out of it. And he says that 95% of people can't, have not got the ability to, to use their knowledge to make money out of it, right? But if you're able to, be persuasive um, and you're able to tell people that your knowledge is very special and you're able to tell people that your knowledge is valuable you can make a lot of money out of it and they say that today and in fact margaret that's exactly what they thought back then because it's not about territory it's not about ownership it's about what you know and what we do see is, is as this all develops, as this all goes through in time, what we do see throughout prehistory is knowledge is king. And Peter will tell us that. It's not easy to mine tin. In fact, it's not easy to understand that the rock that you're looking at, you can actually produce anything out of at all. But if you get approximately 950 or nearly 1000 degrees C, you're able to produce tin out of rock, right? And to be able to do that is special knowledge. And this is, this is, this is the message throughout the whole of prehistory. It's knowledge that makes you king, right? Not having the biggest sword. Well, actually that that's, um, um, that's if you can create a sword out of stone, then you know you can you can do both, right? But that's not the point. Let's let's go let's go to what um, what Broadmain tells us, and then we'll see if we can get um, Maiden Castle up here, and then we'll call it a night because um, a lot going on here. And what I'm going to do is. Um, I'm going to be picking on Anne next because Anne's been quiet for too long. <laughs> right. Okay. Back to our little monument from above. Let's see what my notes tell me. So although we've excavated at Maiden Castle, um, we do believe that Broad Main, this bank barrow, is the earliest monument within this very long monument of archaeological evidence it's on high ground of all places so it's favoring the high ground and then eventually what we do say is that the various other barrows associated with broad main demonstrate 
that this monument is held in importance within the landscape for a very, very long time. The sighting of this bank barrow at Broad Main has been carefully selected. It has been built on an access parallel to the Ridgeway itself. And what we do see is that this itself, and interestingly enough, the barrow is overlooked on the southeast side by the high point on the White Horse Hill, but provides expansive views to and from the lower lying areas to the north. So it, it's, it's a very, very important monument that imbues the sense of connectedness with the landscape. And listen to this last thing. And this is very, very important. This is very much what I've been saying. The Bank Barrow, a conceptual connection with the landscape. The reasons for this monument is the desire to weave the barrow into the natural world, thus making it seem immutable and part of the natural order. Now, thinking about the natural order, we've mentioned that, haven't we? It's almost as if the people from our past wish to have a natural connection with the world around them. And using the following words, the visual cue provided by the bank barrow may have established um, a sense of a sense of movement within the landscape. It's a ridge, it's built upon a ridge. A, where do you traditionally move along a ridge? It doesn't go for the full length of the ridge, it only goes for uh, 250 meters, but it's, it's very much associated with the ridge. And it says that these, this monument itself um, is very much mm -hmm where Bronze Age monuments, not Bronze Age monuments, where other monuments seem to be attracted to, not just in the Neolithic landscape, but in the Bronze Age landscape much further on in time. So in other words, this monument itself is important for thousands of years. Even though nobody does anything with it, they leave it there. And it's very important for the landscape for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. So what I'd like to do now is I would like to, uh, I would like to have a little bit of a conversation with Anne whilst I get my Maiden Castle stuff up ready. Um, and what I need to do is I need to bring Anne in on here. Anne, you've usually got something to say about my lectures. I want you to crack in there and say something, oh. babe. Well, I think that the, if you look at the borough and the effort and work put into that. We haven't mentioned that. It was we up, haven't mentioned, yeah. No, but they could, it must have been. They had to do a lot of digging yes. or, or something. Yes. That yes. means, and to do that, it yes. must have been very valuable to them to put that kind of effort into it. It had oh. great, great value to them, didn't it? It must have done. Yeah. Yes. Um, as I said, we don't quite know what it's for, but because they don't have possessions, and I don't think at that time they had too much stratification of the uh, society, did they, of kings and slaves? They, they didn't. They, they didn't because yeah. actually, you 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 said that the, the couple of things that you said at the beginning were were, were major, <laughs> um, but when you're talking about um, um, this sort of, they didn't need to have, they didn't need to have this sort of um, people in control of things. No, they, no they, that's they, right. That's what I said. Yeah. They didn't have that. So the fact that they made this big effort and put all this work into it and nobody made them do it because they did it as a community together. The, the, the kind of, the, the one, the only thing in a sense that, it seems to come to me with that is the fact that 
religion or aspects of it, not, not necessarily a religion, but things related like um, their ancestors or ghosts or whatever they want to believe in, that if they don't have possessions and they don't have leads and they don't have else, then that is where their importance of it probably came from. That's just a thought. No, it's not just a thought. Uh, that, well, it's that, just that, my thinking. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that, that was very, very important stuff, to be honest with you. That, that was very important stuff. And what, 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 we, what we've got mm. is, is um, you know, we, we've got a little bit of a description of the one uh, uh, Maiden Castle now. So yeah. that was really, really good. I, I really appreciated that. Um, and what I'm going uh, to actually ask now is, is, is David's point of view. David, have you got any point of view on this? Not really, not really. Are you, are you reading anything from it, though? Are, are you seeing anything? Are you seeing something that you can relate to? No, I think we make it. I'm very suspicious that all this is making a lot out of nothing because nobody knows what they thought. OK, OK. Well, no, that, 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 that's a fair enough point of view. That is a very fair enough point of view. OK, we, 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 we can go with that. Um, but now we're going to look at what, what one of these excavations was telling us. Now, this itself is one that we're going to come on to. It's a bit of a crude one, uh, but this is what Maiden Castle used to look like. Um, a and I'm going to put it on the screen. <coughs> okay, where are we on the screen? Hang on. Da -da 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 -da. Screen. Very good. Right, are you getting that? Yeah. <laughs> right, okay. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna we're gonna put in that's what that's what Maiden Castle looks like today. Oh well, not today, hang on a minute. Nope. That's what Maiden Castle looks like today. And what this is is basically where you've got this bit here. Right, you can't actually see the bank balance from that view. But where you've got that there, that one at the top, right? That then shows when we go to the other image. Hang on. When we go to the other image and we do this. That one at the north end of the screen. And that sort of gray line there is the bank barrow. It's a bit of a weird monument, very strange monument. Um, now, this mound itself is an amazing, and I'm going to turn my fire off for a minute because it's getting a bit hot. Hang on a minute. That's an amazing 556 meter in <coughs> length mound. And initially it had two ditches dug either side. Um, it follows a slightly curving east-west course across the interior of Maiden Castle. Um, and it, it basically remained there as a monument after this become an Iron Age site. So what, what they basically said is that they believe that this monument was built in three separate sections. And the classical words are, the contour survey shows that for the whole of its length, the barrow is set on a crest um, that sort of runs along a summit of a ridge, suggesting that it was deliberately placed upon that ridge, very similar to the <clears> one <throat> that we've just looked at, it appears to not have a funeral uh, performed as a funerary function. So it was not for a funerary purpose, right? Now, David's point was very, very valid. Um, uh, David, if I paraphrase some of this and, it, and it's wrong, shout out, right? But David indicates that um, we're making too much of too little. 
So let's think of, if that's wrong, David, you need to say, but that's my interpretation of what you just said. Um, so um, what we need to do is we need to go with what David said. So it's not used as a funerary monument, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna, and, and I don't think you can disagree with this, David, what we're gonna go with is what Anne said. It took a great deal of effort to build this long 546 meter in length bank with ditches either side. You can't deny that, that is actually fact. Carl, but the, how do you Oh, go on, you're in your flow, carry on. Yeah, well, I was, I, I was just coming out of my flow there. Yeah. So there was no funerary function with it at all. There was no cremations, there was no bones, no nothing with it. Margaret. How do you know that they didn't build wooden uh, bridges, if you like, going across the ditches so they could actually get up to the top? Why not? Well, they could have done. Uh, well, actually, surely there was I, nothing stopping to get to the top. They they carried the material up to the top to construct the damn thing. Yeah, but what I'm what I'm saying after they after they taken the soil out of the ditch to the top of the bank that they left it right, and and the and the one the one point is the one point is this Margaret right, what we're going to do we're going to we're going to entertain what Margaret said, right? We're going to entertain what David said, and we're going to entertain what Anne said. We're going to try and get a bit about what all three of you said. Right, bit of what David said. Um, we're making too much of this. Um, a bit of about what Anne said. This is a great achievement. Um, and why not sit on the top of the bank, right? Um, well, why not sit on top of the bank, right? Um, and and maybe, but you don't take artifacts with you. This is the point. There's no there's no evidence of any artifacts on there, right? Um, now. Now, what we do find is that there is something that we have missed. Sir Mortimer Wheeler excavated on this monument in the 1930s, and another chap called Atkinson in 1951, and then the guy called Sharples in the, the 1985, right? And what Sir Mortimer Wheeler encountered was that there were post holes that one or two post holes that had been created along this ridge. However, it turned out then that those post holes might actually be to do with later activity, which would make sense. A few other thing, a few other things that we, we need to say, right, is that this is the bank itself is 430 foot above ordnance datum but basically above sea level so back then being the only monument to show out across the landscape right there was no other banks and ditches that this was the only thing there it would be shown out for miles around unfortunately it was still showing very clearly until the 1600s when it was plowed out and it, it still remained there um, into the 1600s, but the bank was plowed out, which, which, which is a, a massive, massive shame. Um, so this is another thing, right? This is another thing, right? Um, when Sir Mortimer Wheeler excavated part of this monument, what he found out was that the soil in the mound was uniform. It was the same soil. There was no changes to it. It was just the same soil. Um, and the interesting thing, what he then found was the ditch around the outside, after the monument had been used for a period of time, it's the, the ditch around the outside, it, it almost as if, um, um, as it's now come into a new period, the ditch filled up with basic rubbish, filled up with silt and path uh, evidence and all the rest of it. It, it was just material was chucked in there. And in the later layers, what they actually came across 
um, was actually pottery from later periods and all sorts of things. So the ditch was filled in. However, the bank remained. And what we're going to do, we're going to leave us with one last problem and question. Right. And then we're going to call it a day. So hopefully I've taken in on board everything that everybody said. But what I'd like to do is it's not showing. Oh, God, hang on. Uh, what I need to do is hang on. Ah, oh, yes. <coughs> right, bingo, it's there. Right, in the reconstruction, right, um, uh, people people argue how Maiden Castle was 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 constructed, right? People, some archaeologists like me say that there were only a few buildings there. Others say there were lots more. But in this reconstruction, right, forget all that, right? You can see, you can see between those two towers, above the first hand tower on the left, you can actually see in the reconstruction, you can actually see a bank running across, running through the site. Can you see that? Yeah. That's where it is, the 546 meter long bank, right? The point I've got to make is as follows. When they when they were building in the Iron Age, right? When they were building in the in the Iron Age, this monument, the bank we know until the 1600s was still standing in pride of place across the monument. Why didn't they take all the soil away to help build the banks? And they didn't. That is the point. So I can I can see where Dave's coming from. Right. But I can clearly see where Anne's coming from. And what I'm going to say is this. The bank itself meant something very special to the people at Maiden Castle, as it did with Broadmain and as it did with with most other examples of these bank barrows. Whatever they were used for, in Anne's words, it took a great deal of effort to create them. They were not used for burial. And whether you wanted to sit on top and have a picnic or not, there's no evidence to say that happened either. They were built for a reason. They were built for a purpose. And I believe, as my interpretation is one interpretation, it could be wrong, people, but it was built for a reason. And we need to respect that reason. On that note, let's call it a day. Let's see if there are any questions. And what we're going to do, uh, we're going to actually start with... Um, we're going to start with Margaret, then we're going to do David, and then Anne, and then we're going to do um, the other three. Because we haven't heard from Drina at all. Um, or, or Andy. Peter's been half asleep. Right, Margaret, go for it. Well, in nearly all of these old books that I've got here about the Neolithic period, they nearly all talk about the land of the ancestors as some yeah. kind of mystical, spiritual place. Yes. Um, yeah, in, in just about all of them, especially the one about Avebury, they talk about the ancestral, the land of the ancestors. Can I, can I, can I just say something, Margaret, right? Mm. You, you, you know me by now on my teaching. You know I want to resist that and you know I want to go into a different direction and I'm struggling because I'm more or less in that school of thought as well. I will try mm. right, to give you another point of view but as that's the way I'm, but um, I, I think I think what we've got to do is we've got to have an open mind, and I don't mind people saying I'm wrong, but um, but what the powerful sentiment is what Anne said is that this monument took a lot of effort. What was the landscape like around um, the broad main? bank barrow was it still wooded or had the land been it, it, it would have been it would have been wooded at that point still mm. um and actually the other thing as well is right i've fallen i've fallen in for my own trap haven't i i've basically said look this landscape this monument could be seen for miles around mm. well that's 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 absolute poppycock if there were lots of trees still around yeah that's what i was thinking in that case, <laughs> achieving, creating something like this, which is not really to be seen by many people, 
is an even bigger feat. It's yeah, but it's a complete mystery, isn't it? It's even more of a mystery, yeah. Mm. Even more of a mystery. Oh, okay. If that's you done for that, Margaret, we'll go on yeah. to David. Uh, yeah. Dave, David, anything you else you'd like to say? No, thank you. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, right. Uh, who's next? Uh, Anne. Go uh, on, Anne. You touched today on um, when the trees go, they are never re replaced. And uh, this it, is not in the upland areas. I got to correct that. Not in the upland areas. Yeah. Beca it, it, because the, the soil creep, the soil goes not in the upland areas. Uh, when you look at something like castle. a bit of an aside because I was reading yeah. an article of, of last week about the remaining um, ancient woodlands, the really rainforests, which are still, yeah. still in our country. Mainly on the west, there's little clumps of them here there, and there's groups trying to restore them and protect them because that there, you know, it, and it just, I just thought sort of, you're, you're sort of explaining how, where most of this went, you know, and it's it gone since obviously over time. But I found that quite interesting that they're trying to really protect this stuff, the, the little bit that's left here. And, yeah. um, you know, and I thought that was an interesting article. It only vaguely touches on what you're saying, but it joins up with it somehow in my mind. I feel everything connects somehow. You know, almost everything I read or see, they connect up. Um, yeah, they, they, yeah, I'd go with that. Yeah, they do. There, there, there is a sense of connection. And, um, you know, it's, um, um, you know, I, I, I remember when um, we, we were, uh, we, we were, um, <coughs> you know, when, when we were looking at Callahallan, the, the mummies at Callahallan, the Bronze Age mummies, yeah. Um, and um, when we were talking about subjects, um, there, there were a few of you um, who basically said, look, let, let's just look at the Kala Hallen mummies. That would be really interesting. Um, and um, yeah, and, and, and actually, I know I know David mentioned that at the time. He basically said, I mentioned Kala Hallen and said, oh, we got we want to know more about these mummies, um, yeah. which is great. I, I want to look more about them, really. But to actually get there, we, we need to, what we need to do, we need to plod on and we need to. So what I need to do next week is I need to do a less brain teasing thing next week. And, and that's what I'm going to do. We, we, we've done a lot more than we should have tonight. So, yeah. It's been very interesting. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Anne. Right. OK. Who's next? We haven't heard from Drina for the whole month. <laughs> I don't think she wants to say anything. No, I, no, I really haven't got anything to say. Yeah. I was wondering about walking along the bank, whether that would come into any ritual. I, I, actually, actually, if you want to, if you want to open up the can of worms, yes, it would. If you want to put in the Nazca lines there, walking along the line. Um, and my other lectures that I do on a, a Thursday uh, between sort of six and seven, walking along the line and w walking along that sense of connection. Uh, and everything, even a trackway, that's a ritual. As you wander down to the shop, shop Drina on a road, a pavement, that's a ritual. Um, as you go for a walk with the dog, Margaret, that's a ritual. Right? Wow. <laughs> it is a ritual. And, 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 and you, there's no doubt about it. So why not? Why what kind not? of tools would they have used to dig out those ditches? Ah, uh, I mean, these we, days would use... Uh, buckets and spades and shovels what was the well, equivalent back then well the thing is we've got to think about the soil the soil is going to be very different because it, it it's a very different topsoil um than it is today so it's going to be a lot softer and it's going to but it's still going to be quite difficult to dig through um but what we do have evidence in places such as um um grimes graves um in in the likes of um East Anglia, um, and we actually see um, in places like um, Avebury, we know that they're using um, 
um, yeah. uh, animal scapulas, for example. Oh, right. Um, and and they they use it. They might they sort of wooden shovels and stuff. So we're finding some of this down the the sco little scoops. So we're yeah. finding these down the mines. So we know what they're using. Right. There'd have been a lot of tree roots and rocks mm -hmm. there as well. Exactly. Wouldn't have been easy to do. Exactly. But do, do you know? Do you know what? It's easy to get. It's easy to get in connection with with past technology. For mm. example, I know there weren't potatoes around back then in Britain, but um, I've been digging up my my potatoes, right? Um, and and somebody said to me, right, the way you're planting your crops ain't going to work. So basically, what I did, I took out a sod of earth, um, and I and I created a bank with a sod of earth either side, right? Um, and I and I put my potatoes in between the sods of earth, and I put some soil over it, right? And mm. those potatoes have been the best. There you go, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now you nobody told me how to do that. Everyone, everyone I said it, they said it's not gonna work. You're gonna get rot in there, or you're gonna get um earwigs and wood louse, it's gonna eat away at everything. No, it's not. That's why I've got my best potatoes. In fact, I've got potatoes that are that are flat. Mm -hmm. ah. So yeah, so it, it's learning about these things. Um, and also, oh by the way, guys, I, I've um we managed to we managed to get onto the next stage of my roof with the with the with the roundhouse here, right? Uh, and if you can if you can see that, oh yeah, mm. 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 it's well a figure. Of, wow, it's a figure of it. It's a figure of eight roof. Yeah, well done. Yes. Yeah. And that's taken that's months it. to get take a month to get to that stage and i tell you what one of the weirdest things is is that on sunday in the rain and all the rest of it uh we started putting a membrane on the roof we, we, it was like um a, um a linen linen dust sheets and, and we um uh and and we put a, like a membrane on top of that which i haven't got a photograph of um and we tacked all that down and i thought the high winds is going to rip it all off but something that our ancestors knew right that stuff underneath is stopping the air circulation and stopping the roof being ripped off. <clears throat> I didn't think it would work, but no. it, it it is. Um, right, Peter, anything you'd like to say? Only the fact that uh, the amount of effort that was put in, there must be some form of reward for it. People don't they make, put in that amount of effort over that sort of time for nothing. There must have been some... Uh, some something to come from the end of that work, um, whether it was simply ritualistic, or did they get something, uh, some benefit from it? Had to be but there had brilliant. to be, there had to be a reward for that work at the end. It was How many brilliant. animals did they have at that time? Could it be just right, okay, a grazing okay. area, cultivated and grazing? Right. OK, there's a few big questions here. Uh, so I need to take this down. So we, we, we've we've got. We've got cultivating. Um, cult this, this is that's a really really important one. Cultivating and and uh, what was Peter's? Peter's was um, a reason. No, 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 not a reason. We've done the reason. Reward. Peter reward. said reward. And what what did Anne chuck in there? It was of great value. I think the fact that they got did yeah. it. It had to be of great value to bother. Well, ac actually, actually, to be honest with you, that's going to answer Peter's question. The yeah. actual. The actual, the actual creating it is actually the reward, right? Sorry, Pete, for fudging that one. Mm -hmm. But, but um, cultivating. Um, now, when we looked at the forbidden landscape one, burial landscape three, and land of the ancestors four, we didn't even we did have said we said a little bit about where people lived. But we said very, very little about farming, right? Now, this is the problem. This is the key problem about the Neolithic period. What we're finding is that the best agricultural land, um, they're slowly but surely using it as a burial monument, right? Uh, you know, if you look at Salisbury Plain, right? Salisbury Plain, um, you could plant beautiful crops across all of that, right? It's fairly well drained. You've got the River Avon nearby, right? It's perfect, right? 
but they plonk all these bloody monuments across it. <laughs> so the answer, the answer to David's question is, um, and that's cause and effect. That the, the answer, one yeah. of the answers to David's question, there was lots of um, cultivated land in this landscape where they're building these burial monuments. And somebody eventually said, hang on a minute, if you look up, if you look at Woodhenge and Durrington Walls and Avebury and Stonehenge and all the land monuments around there, all the best agricultural land has been used for these pig in bloody monuments, right? So somebody must have said and said, no more, right? We've got to use the remaining cultivated landscape, right? And interestingly enough, you've answered your own question, David, right? Um, even up until recent years, the landscape of Salisbury Plain, Stonehenge and Maiden Castle um, and Durrington Walls was key agricultural land and they were still heavily plowing in this landscape before they started to realize that this was a rich prehistoric landscape. That answers your question. In other words, the best agricultural land was being swallowed up by these monuments. So that's where it is. And also David, if you look at Castle Rig, Castle Rig itself, around Castle Rig, they've got ridge and furrow landscapes in the medieval period, proving yeah. that that is good agricultural land. Would, um, and this bloody monument is in the middle of it. Would it be that they, that they put in them on the agricultural land because it was the easiest to live in and to work rather than if they were putting it into sort of on rocky areas that we couldn't live on, uh, it would be much harder to do. Um, to you be know. honest with you, at, at, at the beginning, they probably thought, right, what we'll do, we'll do a little bit there, and that's fine. It's like a modern-day <laughs> cemetery, isn't it? People to feed anyway, so they didn't need them much, as much land. Yeah, exactly. But eventually, as the population grew, they got yeah. into trouble with the management of the yes. landscape. Yeah. And I, I think what happens, this is, this is the, the, the final answer to that question, and then we'll go on to Andy. Right. I think Peter's done his bit. What happened is that after this megalithic stage in the Neolithic period, monuments got smaller. Mm. In, in, in fact, in fact, the, in, in the Bronze Age, right, you've got these big circular discs, right? And by the end of the Bronze Age, they're small circular discs. Yeah. And in the Iron Age, they're really small monuments indeed. Mm. And then you get, just get people being placed into the ground. That tells you that they've learned that having a landscape full of burial monuments is not a good idea. What did they do in ancient Egypt? They put all these bloody burial mounds and all these frigging pyramids everywhere when they could be using it for agricultural land. I think that answers David's question. Um, thanks, Dave. Um, what about you, finally, Andy? I'm just taking that argument a little bit further. I'm just wondering Please whether... Do. The um, the fact that they're built on the best agricultural ground is something to do with fertility. Um, now, this is something that's come up a lot, and and mm. what you've got, I, you know, I'm not going to dismiss what you said because you you Peter mentioned it earlier on. When you're looking mm. at the avenue um, in regards to um, Avebury, uh, you you've got these. Some are tall and some are fat. Some represent. Uh, uh, the male phallus, others represent the female womb. And they've, they've got this sort of interpretation. Um, but again, these, these, this, the incredible effort placed into building these monuments throughout the periods indicates, um, in, indicates that it's, it's, they, there's, a lot going, there's a lot going on in their minds. And Andy, you know what I'm going to answer with that? It might not just be one answer. It might be lots of different answers. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this, right, people, don't get caught out by one, by one answer for all, right? We've got to think as we did in the Mesolithic period. They're not all doing the same thing. Don't get caught out mm. by that. There mm. may have been a different reason why Avebury was there as opposed to Stonehenge. Why do you think you've got Avebury just down the road, basically, and you've got Stonehenge and you've got Woodhenge and Durrington Walls? You've got all these monuments, mainly meaning completely different things over different time periods. Yeah, I, I, I find the, uh, the, um, the long barrows the, the hardest thing to get me head round. Because I can understand avenues and I can understand, you know, um, 
well, Cursus is not so much. They're another strange one, but um, you know, and and you know, hinges, yeah, totally get those, and and you know, coarse weight enclosures, but long barrows, I just I don't get. I, don't, I can't think why would you build? Why would you go to such an effort to build something like that, which must have taken a lot of effort and therefore must have been there for a very good reason. I just wish the hell we knew what it was. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. Can I just ask something? Oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> go on then. <laughs> go on then. Um, could they use pigs to loosen the ground? Yeah. Did you say picks or pigs? Pigs. P i g s. Pigs. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Wild boar particularly dig up a lot of yeah. ground. Yeah. yeah. Just well, set them loose. Will in the enclosure, Let they'll turn loose. the whole ground over and then they make will. It. Yeah. 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 Usable. And give you something to eat as well. Maybe that's why there's so many oh, pig yeah. bones around Stonehenge. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Does Carl know he's muted? Oh, right. How did I mute myself? Uh, act of God. <laughs> <laughs> I think what it was, I, 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 Dave, Dave, David just went about a couple of seconds ago. So. Oh, bye, Dave. Bye, Dave. He's already bye, gone. Dave. It's gone. Yeah, I think, he, I think it gets too late for him. I he think gets he has, tired. Uh, yeah. yeah. So... Uh, Okay, oh, and Andy, don't forget your shekels, and you, Pete. I've I've sent them. <coughs> when did you do that? Did it did it just before I came on? Hang on, I've got to take this call. All right, go and take that, Andy. Oh, I know he did it. He's always got a phone call coming in, on Andy. When Andy's finished that, we'll uh, we'll call it a day. Yeah. Hang on. I've just oh. had a miss. I just had a phone call from David. He said he's very sorry. His battery just died, and it cut him off uh. suddenly. He said he was he wasn't being rude, and he didn't mean to go in suddenly. But he said he'll see all, see us all next week. Oh, we'll give him our love anyway. No, that's yeah. nice of him to do that. I gotta yeah. be honest with you. That's <laughs> nice of him to do that. Right, so, okay, then, what we're going to do, we're going to call it a night, I think, if nobody else has got anything else to say from Andy, anything to say, Anne, Adrina, Margaret, Peter, um, say it now. Nope. Nope. That's a bloody late one, isn't it? Geometry. Yeah, <laughs> I did wonder about that. Yeah. Oh, shut up, you. No, it's theology. <laughs> That's the important Ge one. I I'm Geometry. guessing... I'm it's guessing there isn't. Uh, I'm guessing there isn't anything in the alignment of these these barrows. Oh, by the way, Andy, thanks for your shekels. It came through on the other doodah, so don't worry. Good, jolly good. It's it's all it's all happening, isn't it? Yeah, I'm saying there's that there's. I'm guessing there's no significance in the alignment of these um, long barrows because I noticed that one. The uh, I think it was the uh, what was it? I can't remember what it was called now. That that the main one you were talking about looked like it was east west. But um, oh yeah, oh, the other one, yeah, yeah, not not the um, the one on the uh, the, the hill fort, Maiden. yeah, Maiden Castle one. Yeah. But I didn't couldn't didn't know what that was. But mm, it's all very mysterious, isn't it? Mm. It's all very very mysterious. It'll just be a windbreak. <laughs> yeah, why not? For all we know, yeah. couldn't it? Yeah. Something to sit and look down on your neighbours. Yeah. <laughs> well, well I, I, actually, there is one last thing I'm going to mention. Right, mm. is that there was this uh, there, there was this farmer in West Wales. Right, he um, he, he had a load of archaeologists coming on and land one day. He said, "Oh, we 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 found all these weird monuments on your land." He said, "All right then." <laughs> he said, "Go and have a look at them." Right. So they had a look at them. They come to the farmer. And said, "Oh." This 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 um this bank this bank on the on the over there right it's obviously um a prehistoric monument and there's one in the shape of a cross he said oh it must indicate this and that and the farmer the farmer looked at them and said um do you know what right my dad created them as windbreaks for sheep <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
good. Might even be a place of punishment where they sent Ooh. people who've not been very well behaved. There's an get angle. Up, get yeah. up yonder and suffer. <laughs> get on the bank and shut yeah. up. Go and sit on the other side of the bank. Yeah. <laughs> The naughty bank. Reasons, there was the naughty yeah. bank. And you had to lay <laughs> the naughty naked. Bank, yes. <laughs> you had to lay naked in the summer months with Drina. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 and you had to you, you, you had to cuddle up. Um you had to cuddle up with Drina to keep warm, that type of thing. Yeah, the naughty barrow. The naughty barrow, yeah. <laughs> The, the, the thing, the thing is, if you if 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 you're one bloke and you've got enough women around, then you, you won't have, need to wear clothes, right? <laughs> they used to say that women would go and rub themselves up against the stones at Avebury in the Baby. hope of getting pregnant. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, but that, that, women get a bit confused sometimes, <laughs> don't they? <laughs> Stereotyping here, of course. But... <laughs> And of course, it's I, blokes that have written this down, don't forget. Yeah, so. yeah. I didn't say this, she did. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is in this book by Aubrey Burl. Oh, well, there you go. Oh, yeah. And in my like Aubrey, it's bound to be in it. I wonder if he's related to John Aubrey. Right. He might be, he might. Hang on, how, yeah. no, Aubrey Burl, how can he be related to John? Uh, one of them's a forename and the other's a surname, you silly yeah, woman. Yeah, but it's, fun. it's an unusual name and they've both got it. Must be then. Yeah. <laughs> but there's a, a link somewhere. Hang on a minute. My head's a bit screwed up. It doesn't mean to say I'm related to Adolf Hitler, does it? Uh, <laughs> well, you never know. No, no, yeah. Well, you could be a communist. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Good one, Pete. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, okay. We'll, we'll we'll call it a day now. So I'll see you all next week. Yes. Well, all right. Then. Um, okay. Night. Uh, my, my, that, that's really done my head in. Christ, I <laughs> might do. How many hours? Two yeah. hours and thirty-nine minutes. Why don't we yeah. just go for two hours and forty minutes? I'll be fine. All right, then. What next? <laughs> Good night, folks. I'll see you next week. Uh, uh, all right. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye. 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 Good night. Good night, all. Bye. Good night. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Carl. Bye. Night -night. My pleasure. Take care. Bye. Night -night. Night, night. night night. Oh, that was a long one tonight. That was really, 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 really long. Um, and you know what? I haven't checked out if there are any messages on you, and I'm just going to see if there's any live chat. Um, oh, my God, there's loads of stuff. What the hell is this? Um, the kind of looms about like a mud bogger in the middle of a meadow ridge going in between the upside of the landscape. What the hell? Uh, what the hell is this? This is terrible. What, what's all these messages? They go on forever. What the hell? Where's your sideburns? Look, look, Tom, right? Yeah, maybe. Oh, I remember people. Oh, but Tom, I can't leave all this up here. This is terrible stuff. Anyway, uh, people, thanks for liking and subscribing. Um, and don't forget to join. And I got more videos out there. So if anyone wants to ask anything about the Neolithic period, please do so now, right? Because um, I, I'm, I'm going to call it a day. It's terrible stuff. Anyway, uh, people, thanks for liking and subscribing. Anyway, um, you could go on a little bit longer if you want, but you know, it's just it's just one of those things. Um, no, nobody's even like this today. Um, so anyway, um, we we've had a really good discussion tonight, and this has gone on for two hours and forty one minutes. I have to go. Um, and we've got seven people watching now, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, I'm just going to wonder 
Um, if there's anyone got any questions that they want to ask now before I leave um, in the live chat, please, please sort of put something in the live chat. So I'm going to go hi. Um, and uh, yeah, if, if somebody wants to say something, say it now. And if not, anyway, thanks for watching. We've got another presentation uh, looking at the Neolithic period on um, at seven o'clock on Thursday. And I've got my weekly videos looking at history and archaeology. So that's great, which is sort of um, that's usually for about 10 minutes, my daily videos. Um, and I've got following the line on Thursday as well. Um, so, yes, two hours is too long. I know it's there too long, Tom, but you've listened for the whole thing. All right. So, Tom, I'm going to go now. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I'm off. Good night. Nostachy Gualachieto and Bob's your uncle and Tom. Um, and the other thing as well is, Tom, don't forget everyone follow me on Snapchat. Right. So my uh, uh, my Snapchat. No, TikTok. That's the one. Follow me on TikTok. It's James a pirate on TikTok. So TikTok, James a pirate. Follow me there. Right. So I'm going to put that on there and then I'm going to call it. Um, James a James a pirate. Follow me on follow me on TikTok. There you go. Anyway, don't forget again. Um, join if you want to. And and please um, like and subscribe. I'm off now. Nobody's got anything else to say, so I'm going to go off. So thank you very much. Uh, and Tom, Savory Scott Landic Productions, uh, make sure you watch um, um, Tom Savory's um, Scott Landic Productions. Um, he's, he's a bit of a stalker now because he watches all my stuff. Um, and, and Tom loves me still. He's, he's, he's a bit like uh, uh, um, a boyfriend I never had and never wanted. Um, anyway, Tom. Um, and we'll speak to you then. Take care, guys. No, 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 guys, no, no, guys, ladies, and everybody. Go, no, no, sorted. Thank you. I'm just going to check in the chat box to see if there's anything in the chat before I close down. Nothing in the chat. Um, and that was a massive long one tonight. Excellent. Over the hills and far away. Lala. Cheers. Take care, guys. Bye. Bye bye. No, 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 no.